teremos essa imensa satisfação de assistir a conferência do professor Michael Tosek, a quem agradeço ter aceitado ao nosso convite para participar da 32ª reunião da Associação Brasileira de Antropologia, que completa 65 anos, sendo a mais antiga das associações em ciências sociais no Brasil. Nossa associação tem enfrentado o desafio de articular a produção científica, a organização e a mobilização de diferentes redes de conhecimento, gerar visibilidade, estimular o debate e, em tempos sombrios, de resistência. A aba assume posições políticas frente a um cenário governamental que desqualifica direitos estabelecidos pela Constituição brasileira e que tem atacado sistematicamente as ciências humanas. O sentido do que fazemos é enfrentar o contexto mais amplo que afeta a antropologia que fazemos entre nós, em diálogo e em interação com a antropologia que se faz no mundo. Aí está a importância estratégica de resistir ao autoritarismo, aos abusos, ao vírus, com o conhecimento, com a troca e com a insubordinação dos saberes. Olá a todos e todas. Estamos aqui hoje com o professor Michael Tossig, um dos conferencistas da 32ª Reunião Brasileira de Antropologia. Coube a mim a tarefa de apresentar brevemente o professor Tossig e sua obra. É uma grande honra realizar tal empreitada, ainda que seja quase impossível sumarizar uma trajetória tão profícua nesse curto espaço de tempo. O professor Tossig é professor do Departamento de Antropologia da Columbia University, em Nova York, sua obra é extensa, primando pelo rigor teórico e pela densidade metodológica. O professor Tossig, ao longo desses anos, se tornou referência importante nos estudos antropológicos realizados no Brasil. Isso se deve, me parece, ao convite constante que ele nos faz a experimentar etnograficamente, a brincar com a linguagem, a ser inventivos. Sua obra, Xamanismo, Colonialismo e o Homem Selvagem, um estudo sobre o terror e a cura, é um marco na antropologia. Foi a partir dessa obra, traduzida, traduzida para o português no começo dos anos 90, que Tosse que se tornou conhecido no Brasil. No entanto, é de 1983 a primeira tradução de Tosse no país, com um artigo baseado no mesmo livro, publicado na revista Religião e Sociedade. Lembro também, a partir de conversas com o próprio Tosse e com a professora Bibia Gregori, que em 1987 ele esteve no Brasil a convite da professora Ruth Cardoso e do Sebrato. Xamanismo representa não apenas uma referência para pensar o colonialismo em suas diversas formas, mas também por propor os valiosos conceitos de cultura do terror e espaço da morte, ou mesmo por nos lembrar, e isso é tão urgente e fundamental nos tempos duros em que vivemos, de que, para todo o terror, existe uma cura, mesmo que ela venha por meio da escrita etnográfica. Levando a sério o que os xamãs do Putumayo lhe disseram há tempos atrás, Tossig nos convida, não apenas em xamanismo, mas em sua obra como um todo, e aqui eu vou citá-lo, a desmistificar e reencantar o homem ocidental, a fim de tornar possível uma nova confluência entre o eu e a alteridade, e a dessensacionalização do terror. Como disse no começo dessa fala, seria impossível sumarizar sua obra, mas chama atenção para a presença constante de reflexões sobre a escrita etnográfica e a experimentação com outras formas de linguagem, como os desenhos dele próprio e o livro I, say, I Swear I Saw This é o maior exemplo, ou fotografias, tal como no livro Michael Caine Museum. Menciono novamente o rigor teórico, com reflexões densas sobre autores que percorrem desde sempre seus escritos, tais como Walter Benjamin e os autores da sociologia sagrada, como Bataille, Caloá e Lerry. Ao questioná-lo recentemente, em uma entrevista que será publicada em breve, sobre qual seria sua mitologia, Tossig me respondeu. Minha mitologia está claramente articulada no prefácio do meu livro Mimesis and Authority, principalmente no final, quando digo, tente imaginar um mundo em que a ciência é natural e tente imaginar um mundo em que a ciência fosse não natural ou sem motivação, como disse Sossi. Ambos seriam igualmente impossíveis de imaginar. 
ambos se autodestroem depois de se, de se contemplar sobre estes extremos. Foi aí que eu pensei na faculdade mimética e também no jogo de copos, que se tornou fascinante e algo que se quer praticar na própria escrita. Então, minha, minha mitologia seria essa, o que eu chamo de faculdade mimética, que é, se preferir, quando uma magia da antiguidade se envolve. Então, essa é a mitologia. Você se envolve com a série pós-estruturalista de linguagem. A partir da leitura de seu último livro, Mastery of No Mastery in the Age of Meltdown, lançado em julho de 2020, impressiona mais uma vez o rigor, a inventividade e aquilo que chamei recentemente em uma conversa com o próprio Tossig de amor e deferência pela antropologia e pelo trabalho que fazemos. Concordo com George Marcos em comentário recente sobre a obra de Tossig quando ele diz que salta aos olhos sua vitalidade, engenhosidade e seu dom para a contação de histórias. Talvez estejam aí resumidas parte das grandes qualidades do trabalho de Tossig que podem nos inspirar. Agradeço imensamente ao professor Tossig por aceitar este convite e por estar conosco nesse espaço cibernético. Ainda que de longe, é verdadeiramente uma honra recebê-la entre nós. Well, look, it's a, a, I'm enormously uh, honored to be invited, uh, and especially uh, because the situation in Brazil is so, uh, so worrying. I realize you're all in a uh, tense uh, and difficult, difficult situation. Uh, it's amazing that you can even get the conference together. To me, as an outsider, it's amazing, and I respect you all for that. I um, uh, want to thank Carol especially for uh, facilitating this invitation. Uh, Carol, thank you so much. Um, and now I'll, I'll start with my uh, little talk. I'll read uh, slowly so that people whose English is not great uh, will have a better chance of understanding. And I would like to... Uh, Uh, have some questions at the end, okay? I, because uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be questions. Now, I'll just break, go straight into it. Uh, th this is an essay uh, I wrote recently, about three months ago, and it's called Tom the Naturalist. Part one, uh, in the 1940s, when I was six years old, growing up in Sydney, in a house in a forest with a creek out back, full of crayfish and a glistening green snake by the letterbox, I loved listening to Tom the Naturalist's weekly radio broadcasts during the children's hour. It was, as I recall, not only his warm voice and storytelling eye for detail that held me, but that he opened up an enchanted space, not so much biological as adventurous. It was proto-biopolitical in a child's format. The fact that it was non-visual was key non-visual. This was Australia before television and cell phone screens, and it left a lot to the imagination, especially for a kid, a child, lolling around on the carpet in front of the speaker of the radio. Why? It was as if the kid became an animal, let's say a shark, guided by the sound waves and the occasional pilot fish darting back and forth from the glowing dials of the radio. Then, as now, animals were the source of endless curiosity, only now it's different, quite different. Before, what was just for kids is now a staple for adults, And the world is not only disappearing, but re-enchanting. The world is not only disappearing, 
but re-enchanting at a fast pace. Clever financial investors are putting their money into nature shows, films, as the rug is being pulled out from under our feet. While we discover every day now a whole lot about animals that once were, that once we were, that once were we. This has led to alternative cosmologies concerning human animal worlds to the point of envisioning immense plasticity regarding the human in the animal, no less than the animal in the human. That is a lot to take in. So to make it simpler, I give it a name, that of the metamorphic sublime. This is a name that emphasizes flux and instability, transformation and hybridity. Think of that kid in the house, in the forest, listening to Tom the Naturalist, with the creek out the back, full of crayfish and a glistening green snake by the letterbox. Now, we are all that kid. Think of that, then multiply by infinity. What has happened is that the world has reconfigured the adult's imagination of the child's imagination, no less than the child's imagination of the adults. Now it's all green snakes by the letterbox and crayfish chock-a-block. The environmental tailspin that whiplashes the planet has undone the moorings of disenchantment that for several centuries and especially since enlightenment and the industrial revolution formed common sense. Instead, today, a mix of sci-fi and something like surrealism has taken its place. A sort of uh, Max Ernst, dark surreality, full of macabre wit and fear. So the argument is that with planetary destruction, what we called disenchantment of the world has disappeared and in its place, the world is becoming re-enchanted once again. The re-enchantment involves a type of surrealism, but a frightening surrealism, a scary surrealism, but nevertheless surreal. My first thoughts on this came many years ago on reading with great delight the first pages of Blaise Sendra's 1948 book, Le Lotissement. The English title is Sky Memoirs, in which he describes at length, full of wit and foreboding, some of the animals he is escorting, or should I say kidnapping, in a freighter from Brazil to France prior to World War II. It was on reading his portrait of the anteater that the thought hit me, banal and insightful, that all animals are surreal. Even my cat, especially my cat, with its very name, let alone its appearance and behavior, 
the anteater displaces reality, that's for sure, and does so in mind-blowing ways. A lively writer, somewhat an anteater himself, Sendraz is a born surrealist, in many respects an overgrown kid, as well as being a Hollywood scriptwriter. But really, he doesn't have to try very hard to make this animal surreal. The anteater does it all on its own, rolling out its long tongue 150 times a minute to pick up 35,000 termites or ants each day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine sticking out your tongue onto an anteater's nest, an ant nest? Such craziness, and surely that's the point, or at least a point, meaning the inevitable anthropomorphization, anthropo, anthropomorphism that we humans impose on animals in what I suppose is a back and forth reciprocation with the animals doing their bit too. Just as we impose the human world on animals, no doubt animals, when they see us, impose their animal vision of us. As regards small children, it is this back and forth, this wonder at difference, that eventually cements the little children into becoming the homo sapiens and stop eating termites. But surely fond memories of the elephant's trunk and scampering monkeys in their nursery rhymes and illustrated books linger on as alternative ways of being. In any event, there is an interesting triangulation here between the animal, the child, and the adult. The animal, the child, and the adult. This is somewhat like the game, I'm sure you have it in Brazil, uh, paper, scissors, rock, but more dialectical, we could say, in the cascading sense of a Bataille or a Delusian dialectic, in which a distorted mirroring is formed out of the adult's imagination of the child's imagination of animals, compounded by the extinction of real animals and their replacement by virtual ones. In his early writings, Walter Benjamin thought that small children passed, small children passed into the colored illustrations in their books. They disappear into the book. That's the, has a lot to do with color. This was part of the theory of color he was developing. The same idea resurfaced in his thoughts on spectatorship in cinema that you read about in his famous essay, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In that essay, he suggested a two-way movement. The body moves into, watching a movie, the body moves into the image, but also the image moves into the body. This, this, this idea of the image moving into the body uh, was also put forth by the German uh, art historian, Abby Warburg with regard to painting. So Benjamin for film, Abby Warburg for paintings. Um, you probably, there's a wonderful book by the French uh, art historian about 10 years ago, uh, Georges Didi Huberman, 
uh, on Abby Warburg. It's a, it's a wonderful, um, very, very theoretically exciting uh, book, Georges Didi Huberman on Abby Warburg. But what about kids listening to radio stories in a world without TV? What about kids listening to the radio in a world without TV? I don't know, can you imagine it? Is there any part of Brazil that doesn't have a TV? I mean, poor as the peasants were when I, where I work, uh, even in the 70s, that's very early, they would have a TV. The TV was the most important thing. I, I remember leaving some money for a woman I stayed with because her stove was so um, so bad. And uh, it, it pained me to think that she had to cook on that stove. And when I came back a year later, the stove was still there. But there was a TV set. So... And anyway, what I'm thinking, what I want you to think about are children growing up in a world without TV, 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. I'm wondering whether listening to radio stories, to stories on the radio, uh, is equivalent to those illustrated books that I was just talking about, that you pass into the image, listening listening, <laughs> lying on the ground, whatever, you pass into the story, the, or the story comes and occupies you. Both ways. In fact, isn't the radio even more likely than an image, a visual image, to allow the child enter into the spoken image than do colored illustrations. And here the body seems very important as the child rolls around on the floor or doubles up on a chair or a sofa. You know, the way little kids are, their bodies are always very, very active, uh, up, down, sideways, roly poly, and you're listening to the story and your body is going doing all these sorts of things. <coughs> Not like an adult. As an adult, you're taught in the Western, the Western body, very, very straight, especially in a country like France or Germany. Uh, and the body seems very important as the child rolls about on the floor, twisting this way and that, like a shark, I suggested at the visual cue, the visual uh, invitation of the glowing dials on the radio. What's more, this space of, this auditory space, this sonic space, uh, seems far more likely to enchant than does the visual. That's my feeling anyway. I, I suppose it's debatable. I suppose it depends upon what sounds, what story, and what image, what visual image. But I, I tend to think that the, uh, listening to a story on the radio is more enchanting. It's more likely to be enchanting than an image, visual image. Listening to a story on the radio, the mind is less fixed, it is prone to flux and change, as well as a good deal of stimulating multitasking, which in the case of adults takes the form of listening while driving. I think a lot of Americans, US people, when the only time they listen to radio is when they're driving, right? They do both things at once and waiting in traffic jams in Sao Paulo and so on and so forth. Uh, you may be listening to the radio, you may be listening to an um, a iPod, whatever it is. Uh, 
Also, uh, in my experience, I would listen to the radio a lot when cooking or washing up, washing the dishes. Yeah. Um, something that just occurred to me, we could talk a little bit about it, is the iPod. I don't listen to iPods. I don't know why. But this must be um, part of the, a new technology that is emphasizing the auditory. Whereas what I'm talking about here, I'm contrasting radio with screens. But I can also, or I should also have thought about an ma amazing amount of hearing through these iPods. Anyway, in his essay on the storyteller, uh, Benjamin Caesars grabs the trance-like state, the trance-like state of mind involved in semi-automatic, boring, repetitive tasks, like washing the dishes, like weaving. He says these situations are the best situations for listening to stories. Your mind is on the washing up, but another part of your mind is listening to the story. It's this combination that he thinks of as the way the body, the way the mind, the way the mind body best receives a story and remembers it. This essay of uh, this essay of Benjamin's, his essay on the storyteller, uh, was focused on the published stories, the written stories of the Russian Nikolai Leskov, as well as on oral story, oral storytelling. But Benjamin did not mention radio storytelling, which is um, amazing since he himself wrote something like 80 stories for kids that he would read on the radio from 1928 into 1930, 31, when it was all stopped because Jews couldn't work on the radio. So I just found it sort of strange that here he was, a, a maestro of radio stories for kids, but he doesn't mention them in uh, his own essay on the storyteller. I don't know if you know these stories by Benjamin, these radio stories for children, and they're, they're absolutely wonderful. Uh, they had to be crafted to 20 minutes. Um, uh, he explains to the kids how difficult it is to just get the right length, not too short, not too long. They're very, um, they're very educational and they're full of um, strange events like the floods in the Mississippi, uh, like the earthquake in Lisbon, uh, like uh, the robbers, the thieves in late medieval Germany and their strange language, uh, how they ruled the countryside and they had their own language, uh, how they were very impressed by Jews they thought Jews were mystical people. They often sold their stolen goods to Jews uh, and they tried to learn uh, Hebrew as part of their secret language. So these are the sorts of things that Benjamin loved uh, to put into, into his stories. Uh, he has two radio stories about the women who work in the marketplace in Berlin. And he seems to have a very good ear uh, for their slang. Uh, so it's very uh, it's very ethnographic uh, as as well. Um, I just uh, maybe I'll remember some more more of the stories, but I'm sure they're in Portuguese. Um, it was only decades after the English translation of the storyteller essay which I think was like 1966, 
it was decades after that that we in the English world uh, learned about these radio stories, which suggests to me the time is now ripe, that it's a good time now to make a comparison between the radio stories and what Benjamin says in the essay about the storyteller. That would be a, a nice uh, PhD thesis. Uh, and this would be likely to, to acknowledge and deepen, you know, my favorite uh, trope that I've mentioned already in this talk. I think comparing the radio stories for children with uh, Benjamin's essay on the storyteller, which is really the Russian, Nikolai Leskov's published stories, written stories, comparing these two, I think would add a lot to my uh, trope of the adult's imagination, of the child's imagination, which involves, of course, the child's imagination of the adult's imagination. It's like a circle. Adults assume things about children and act accordingly. Children assume things about adults and act accordingly. So it's like two mirrors. You could think of it uh, as an anthropologist and the people the anthropologist is studying. Both groups are forming an image of each other and it goes round and round. Part two. This brings me, uh, strangely enough, to the deadly claws of the anteater. The claws that gave me pause, that uh, startled me, when my friend uh, Santiago Matumbahoy in the Putumayo region of the Colombian upper Amazon told me how scary it was to hunt an anteater. I had no idea that he regarded the anteater as a very dangerous animal. Also hormiguero, he called the anteater. There he was, in English as we say, in the bosom of nature, deep in nature, in happily killing, exotic wildlife. Imagine killing an anteater. Here he was, happily killing exotic wildlife, as when on our trip to Machu Picchu in Peru, with a gallon of uh, ayahuasca, yahe, in 19... 1983, we stopped by the Pacific Ocean of Peru, as he had never seen an ocean. A local in a leaky boat, a boat with holes in it, um, and took us and two Italian tourists out to sea, out into the ocean to see the, see the seals. The sky reeled as the dinghy rose up and down. Santiago Matumbohoy, who was then in his 70s, with very diminished eyesight, had sensed what none of us saw. Suddenly, his hands went together and he went over the side of the boat like this. Despite his poor eyesight, he had seen what none of us saw. Foca! he exclaimed under his breath, fuck, seal. He was both excited and pissed off, for he had no spear, he had no weapon. The Italians were mortified, shocked, 
Foca bonito, foco bellissima, they cried, trying to shame him, trying to make him ashamed. The noble savage was more savage than they had bargained for. They couldn't assimilate to the fact that here was the Indian of the forest who was going to kill animals when to them from Italy, all animals are sacred and you shouldn't do that sort of thing. You see their problem? Not just their problem either. Back on shore, I was pleased to be able to <laughs> introduce Santiago Matumbohoy and his assistant, Borbonze, which means young, young man. Uh, I introduced them to shrimp. Shrimp, prawns, little shrimp, langostinos, uh, which they ate without comment, not a word. Later, at a home in the late afternoon, he gazed at the birds flittering from tree to tree. I wish I had a shotgun, he said. A shotgun. Why? So I could kill some of those birds. But that's crazy. They're so small. There's nothing to eat. More than on those shrimp you served us. And this from a man thousands of miles from home, where I had once, and only once, seen him turn into a jaguar. The top half, at least. The bottom half was human, swinging over the hammock with his rolled up dark trousers and his bare feet with the toes splayed out after decades of going barefoot. So his feet resemble the claws of a jaguar or maybe the oso hormiguero. He was singing too. <laughs> that night song that is more a hum, more a hum than it is a song. The hum that comes from the spirits of Yahe, what I think in Brazil is called ayahuasca. So it is said, said that the song is coming from the spirits of, of ayahuasca. People are very unclear about these sorts of connections. You can't trust a lot of what you read. It says hey, this is connected to this, and this is connected to this, and this means that, and that means that. No, no, it's all. To me, the singing sounds like a duet, a duet. Back and forth between the wind coming off the river and the croaking of numberless frogs rah, 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 vibrating in millennial mud. Cattle stomp in the corral, dogs bark. So here was something to think about as regards multinaturalism. An interwoven mesh of spirit and music, animals and humans, spirit and music and animals and humans, in adventurous discord Not all that different, really, from lying on the carpet in front of the radio, imagining the animals conjured up by Tom the Naturalist in his stories. Three. Years went by. 
I'll just make a note here. Years went by, the kid grows up and gets rid of those imaginations, imaginings prohibited by common sense. That world of the child is, is no longer valid. It can be psychoanalyzed. It can be put into a biography, but it's no longer forming the mode of perception and the language of the, of the adult. The kid grows up and gets rid of these imaginings prohibited by common sense until one day, as a first year student in medicine, he goes to a zoology lecture, packed with students, maybe, I don't know, 300, 400 students, huge lecture. And there on the board, we call them blackboards. I don't know if you still have blackboards in Brazil. The world's worst thing was to get rid of the blackboards and put up these whiteboards. You know what I mean by a whiteboard? Just a sheer white board. And you have to have a magic marker. You know, you have to have a magic marker to write on it. Well, horrible stuff. Uh, <laughs> but this, in that, in, <coughs> this was a blackboard, a blackboard that was the length of the room, the length of the big lecture theater, okay? And on that blackboard, in that zoology class, 400 students, there were the most wonderful colored chalk drawings. Red, blue, green, yellow, purple, whatever. There were drawings of animals stretching from one wall to the other. Yes. It was the very same Tom the Naturalist. He had stepped out of the radio. He was a university professor of zoology, but he also had this radio show for kids. And can you believe there I was, 17, 18, walking in there, this bl blackboard stretching, from one side to the other with all these colored chalk drawings of animals. And there was the guy. He must have spent hours drawing these animals. Now I say animals, but actually it's the, it, it's correct, but actually it was the interiors, the abdominal tract and the uro something tract and the uh, cardiovascular systems and uh, the reproductive systems of a dogfish or whatever it was, a guinea pig or, you know, the stuff that you learn uh, in first year zoology. There it was all on the board. When the lecture was over, this would be rubbed out without ceremony. So the guy would spend, I don't know how long making this thing. And then as soon as the lecture's over, you know, it all has to be wiped out. Amazing. Next week, there would be another set of drawings. And it too would be erased. not unlike the coming and the going of the imagery with your hey, ayahuasca. Only we dumbasses, we knuckleheads in the audience, we had not the slightest inkling of the pearls that were being cast to the swine we were. We wanted 
photographic slides. What strikes me about this is how beautiful was that fragile moment, now banished by the brutality of PowerPoint. And second, the rhythm from disenchantment, then re-enchantment, once again. What I'm getting at is the kid lying on the carpet is living in an enchanted world. The kid growing up inhabits a culture of disenchantment. which is suddenly the re-enchanted world is brought again with those colored drawings on the blackboard, resurrecting the world of a six-year-old child. It is often said we don't appreciate something until we have lost it. And I believe this accounts for the renewed interest in animals and the possibilities for a different communion with them and them with us. It seems pretty obvious. We have been subject so long to the trope of disenchantment in a grasping thing, thing world that it is today difficult to come to grips with re-enchantment without sounding like a romantic idiot, without sounding like a starstruck dreamer. In good part, this is because what is happening now is what I call a, a baneful enchantment, um, a macabre enchantment, a scary enchantment. Frightening. Think of it as magical realism that we're now living. In a, in a terrible key. I mentioned that this and we can talk a bit about it when I finish because I think that our imagination and our language uh, in the in, uh, speaking Western worlds, uh, Latin, including Latin America, uh, the language falls so far behind uh, the uh, apocalyptic uh, terror that is now upon us and every day more so. It's like... Mm. You go, uh, 30, 40 years ago, people went to the Amazon and studied a different culture with a different language and, and so forth. And there was two cultures being encountering, right? But today, what if we were to say the culture of the planet is like an exotic culture, it's a foreign culture, it's a work of art, it's terrifying, it's homicidal, it's like living in a fairy tale. Where are the resources to describe that sort of reality that we are now living through. This inability to express oneself, as I see it, about the current situation, must have been the dilemma of the dinosaurs as they disappeared from the face of the earth 
searching for a means of expression adequate to their extinction. How do you express your extinction? I guess I'm saying. Meanwhile, words fail. As in my memory, the colored chalk animals dance across the stage. Thank you. That's it.